You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you guys for coming. How's everybody doing? Doing well? On this fine Sunday evening, you guys go to church today? You better. You better have gone to church today during this pandemic. Did you attend via Zoom? Okay. Looks like we're in good shape. Let's get started. So we've been chronicling the events of the Pastor Tony Spell debacle for a few weeks. When we left off, he was still holding church services despite having the virus. Some protesters showed up to the church and he was arrested for allegedly trying to run down one of the protesters with a bus. Court ordered not to hold church services at his megachurch, which usually holds about a thousand people. He decided to go anyways. That's where we left off. Well, now there's an update. He says he won't obey health orders until they sell popsicles in hell. In March, the Satanic Temple held an infernal ritual outside the Washington State Capitol. Christian nationalist and state representative Matt Shea joined in a counter-protest and had some less than savory things to say. We're going to take a look at Matt Shea, his beliefs, and his disgusting actions at the counter-protest. Who's going to take the coronavirus vaccine when it comes? Based on how much damage the virus is doing, anybody of sound mind. But there's a small but significant segment of the population who's ready to endanger their lives and the lives of everybody around them by already swearing off the vaccine because it might be made with stem cells. LifeSite News, a Catholic anti-abortion website, is gathering signatures for a petition to protest mandatory vaccine orders, which haven't even been issued. If you want to call in and leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. Try to keep it to 30 seconds or or less, because I unfortunately won't have time to cover the voicemails that are on the longer side for time constraint reasons. So see if you can keep it to 30 seconds or less, if possible. Hey, this is Owen. If you're comfortable, leave your first name and state at the sound of the tiny truck backing up. This is an uncivil discussion. I guess. You do you think Islam is a a cult? Short but sweet voicemail. Um, do I think Islam is a cult? I talked about this a little bit on the last one because I've had people accuse me, quote unquote, of not covering Islam because I like I'm an SJW or some other nonsense like that since I started my channel. I have covered Islam, but I do not think it's a cult. Now, let me explain why I say that, and maybe I can get you on board with me. Cults take very specific forms and and use very specific tactics to control people. Some of the specific tactics that cults use involve behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. In my opinion... To be a cult, there has to be some sort of hierarchy that's enforcing the rules. Some some hierarchy that's enforcing behavior modification through a system of rewards and punishments to kind of create this cult identity. A lot of the time when cults form, they form with extreme unity like look at jehovah's witnesses and their whole belief system there is so much unity in the religion some congregations will differ on some issues here or there like my congregation could play pokemon um but other congregations couldn't some congregations can read harry potter but others can't small little deviations like that but you won't find a Jehovah's Witness congregation that is okay with people getting a blood transfusion or getting an abortion or something like that. Uh, if you do happen across something like that, everybody in that congregation would be disfellowshipped, all of the elders would be deleted, and it would be removed from the religion completely. It, it's an extremely serious thing. They, they have to have unity of mind. So for that reason, I say a category like Christian or feminist or something can't be a cult. By definition, a category is not a cult. 
only groups, not categories. You have to drill down and get specific with the, the groups that you're talking about if you want to identify it as a cult or not. Islam is a category. There are a lot of subgroups within Islam. And there are Islamic cults, but Islam as a whole is not a cult, just like Christianity as a whole is not a cult. So that's kind of my position on it. Now, I did mention feminism earlier, and I'm just going to elaborate on that a little bit. There are groups out there that don't have a hierarchy in the strictest sense that are still cults. You can have a cult without having a hierarchy. It's possible. When there is a group that has cult-like tendencies, a hierarchy organically forms if none is present. Like, for example, in Facebook groups or Twitter groups or f just friend groups or whatever. Some way of people gathering and communicating with each other. Reddit, sub... Uh, I'm sorry, subreddits, things like that. You'll find that people organically form a hierarchy. Uh, and w some of the ways that they do that is by proving themselves to be the most pure, quote unquote. I'm not really sure how else to phrase that. Showing themselves to be more pure in the ideology than the other people around them. And when that happens, they'll say things like, they'll say some really, really extreme stuff. Or they'll create memes that are really, really extreme because they want to show people around them that they're very, very committed and they believe this to the death. When they do that, the people around them like pat them on the back, give them likes and say, yeah, you're right, 100%, I'm with you. It's kind of the nature of social media in many ways. So I'd say... In a lot of cases, if you're dealing with a group that has a hierarchy that's forming organically like that, it's probably through social media. At any rate, the question from the voicemail was, do I think that Islam is a cult? Islam is a little bit too broad to call a cult. Um, Christianity is too broad to call a cult. There are Islamic cults out there, 100%. There are Christian cults out there, obviously. They exist. And there are non-religious cults out there. QAnon is a political cult, for example. Lots of interesting stuff to research. If, if you're ever wondering about non-religious cults, you can check out QAnon. Pretty cool thing to research. Really, really sad in many ways, too. Hey, Owen, this is Dave. Um, from New Jersey. Ex-Joe's Witness. I just have some questions to ask you, man. Like, how do you... uh? deal with the unprogramming that takes years to get done. Like I was a witness for 15 plus years, grew up as one. And it's really hard to sometimes shake the guilt and shame I feel for doing things I know aren't wrong. What things do I deal with in my everyday life that are not wrong, but I feel feel guilty for doing and how how do i get past that stuff when i left the religion having a worldly girlfriend was just like devastating to me it was so terrible i just felt so bad about having a, a girlfriend outside the truth and you know living a normal life with her just li being in a normal relationship with her i felt so guilty for that that persisted through the years that guilt but eventually, it, it started to fade. Every now and then, it does pop back up in my mind. When I first left the religion, I remember I, I, I felt so guilty about having a worldly girlfriend that I actually got married to her, so I wasn't living in sin anymore. I'd known her for like a total of nine months or something. Well, I knew her longer than that, but we had been dating for like nine months or something like that. And I got married nine months into the relationship because I didn't want to be living in sin anymore. It's such a stupid fucking reason to get married. To this day, every now and then I get this like tinge of guilt in the back of my mind. Like I'm doing something wrong by not being married or not 
I don't know. It's like this background guilt that's with you, even if you're not doing anything wrong sometimes. It's awful. As I said, it's probably going to be with me for the rest of my life, but it does dull. It does dim a little bit. Sometimes I will do something that I know is not wrong, but Jehovah's Witnesses view as wrong, and I will do it over and over and over again until that guilt goes away, until I don't feel that in the back of my mind anymore. Um, basically desensitize yourself to it. That could, that could be helpful, as long as it's safe and legal and everything. Um, not a danger to your health, then, yeah, that, that could be helpful to you. Hi, Owen. Um, my name is Tara, and I'm calling from Florida. I, um, I kind of grew up in a very large Southern Baptist church. Um, I would not call it cult-like or anything, but it was it was really large. Like, it had two separate services and each one boasted about 3,000 members. So even though it doesn't qualify as a mega church, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on mega churches. Um, are they a little bit more cult-like? Are they... I really don't know, but I was <laughs> just wondering your opinion on them. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the phone calls. A really interesting question. Generally speaking, um, you said yours was three about 3,000 members. I would definitely call that a mega church, and it had two ser two separate services. Each one had 3,000 members. Yeah, I would say that's a mega church for sure. I mean, I guess there are some mega churches out there that have like 10,000 or even 20,000 people every Sunday, right? God, parking would be a nightmare for something like that. For the most part, usually when you have a mega church, the leaders of the mega church are typically really bad people, strangely, like unusually bad people. They they usually have like a very specific um, ideology that they stand for, and they always get involved in politics in some way. Like look at Ke uh, look at Kenneth Copeland, for example. He is a Trump supporter, and he is a complete nutcase. Uh, Joel Osteen is a little bit different because he's more of like a self-help kind of person. Uh, he's a little bit less fire and brimstone and aggressive, but he still spreads misinformation like wildfire. Generally speaking, I say mega churches are really, really awful. You know, you may say that they aren't a cult, but in s some cases they are. They just straight up are. I don't know about yours specifically, but in some cases mega churches are cults. It's not just a hierarchy. That's not the only determining factor behind it. It needs somebody to set up a system of rewards and punishments, even if it's just one guy. And that one guy can be the preacher at this megachurch, telling people they need to do this, they need to live their lives that way, they need to, if they feel these feelings, then they need to block them. If they think these thoughts, then they need to replace them. That kind of thing. That's the kind of thinking that leads to a cult-like mindset. I would not count out the possibility that your church was a cult. Obviously, I don't know anything about your your specific church, so I can't say one way or another. But it's not um, counted out by default there. Yeah, uh, I was wondering um, your take on the idea of a government banning a church. While I kind of want to agree with you, um, I would compare in some circumstances the banning of organizations like the Ku Klux Klan or or, or organizations that become essentially terrorist operations. Um, if the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or Catholics, any one group, is a group that is fostering these things and causing and covering up these behaviors, I don't care if someone believes in being Catholic or Jehovah's Witnesses on a personal level, but you have an organization, a church with a hierarchy performing these things. What's the difference in that case between uh, that and the mafia selling drugs or killing people? It's kind of a harsh comparison, but still, it's the hierarchy and organization carrying out these things. 
And so what, what's your take on banning that um, to simplify it, banning the organization of a church, but still allowing its practice uh, on a on a personal level? Uh, I'm just pitching that one at you. Take it however you will. Uh, thank you. Have a nice day. Extremely interesting question, man. Thank you so much for calling in with that because, you know, this really got me thinking, like, what is my position on this exactly and why do I hold that position? So right now, a lot of people know Jehovah's Witnesses have been banned in Russia because they're, they've been called an extremist organization and extremist organizations are not allowed in Russia, I guess. So they've been banned. They're not allowed to gather. You're allowed to believe it. You're allowed to hold these beliefs or whatever, but you're not allowed to gather at the Kingdom Hall. Pretty much what exactly what you're describing here. You don't have a problem with the people holding the beliefs and practicing it at home or whatever, but banning the organizations who are pretty much acting like the mafia. And honestly, you said it's a harsh comparison. In some cases, it's not a harsh comparison. In some cases, it is absolutely exactly like the mafia, like the things that they do, the ways that they do it, the manipulation tactics. I mean, just look at Scientology. It is like the mafia in a lot of ways. So not an unfair comparison. So what's my position on this? There are bodies on these organizations' consciences. There are bodies that these organizations are responsible for, especially the Ku Klux Klan, like you mentioned, not just them. Jehovah's Witnesses have bodies on their hands. Scientology has bodies on their hands. So in a lot of ways, it is a lot like the Mafia. You're right. Should we ban them? The problem with banning organizations like that, and we can see this happening in Russia because they banned them, so we know the results. We know what happens when you ban them. Their persecution complex comes out full swing. And it's not just them screaming religious persecution. It's everybody around you. It's everybody. Like, there are human rights watchdog groups in the U.S. basically lobbying for Jehovah's Witnesses, working with Jehovah's Witnesses to get them reinstated or whatever in Russia right now. Human rights groups. Because people believe that it's a fundamental human right to assemble or to hold these beliefs and these practices and things like that. Banning a religion usually ends worse for you than for them, pretty much. It's, it does more damage to the cause because the government loses the respect of the, the people of the world, the reasonable, rational, honest-thinking people of the world, usually side with the right to assemble. So how do you deal with it? I believe how we should deal with it is, since banning these religions usually ends up worse for us than for them, we should fine the organizations for every human rights violation. Say $10 for every human rights violation. Jehovah's Witnesses are telling people that they're not allowed to talk to their friends or family who leave the religion. That's a human rights violation. Articles 18 and 20 of the Declaration of Human Rights. Find them $10 per violation. You would find that before long, they run out of money. And either they close their doors completely, or they stop. One of the two. So... That's my solution to it. It may not be a perfect solution, may not be the solution that we need, but I do think that it would be a better solution than banning the religions outright. Because as I said, it, it, it almost invariably ends worse for us than for them. When we come back, we're going to talk about Tony Spell seemingly actively trying to spread the virus to his church members. So give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. The first article I wanted to take a look at is entitled, Christian Pastor, I Won't Obey Health Orders Until They Sell Popsicles in Hell. 
Now, this is Pastor Tony Spell of the Life Tabernacle Church. And as I mentioned before, basically, this guy has been holding church services through the entire pandemic, refusing to hold them online like any responsible church would and has. And it got to the point where he he even had the virus and was still going to church and holding services. It came to the point where he was court-ordered to not hold services. And the judge said, are you going to go? Are you going to break court orders? Because if you tell me you're not going to break court orders, I'll send you home with an ankle monitor. If you tell me you are going to violate court orders, you can sit in jail until it's over. This is around Easter time. And he said he'd make up his mind. He said some nonsense about he'd think about it, he'd pray on it, and he would let him know. Well, I guess they ended up letting him out on an ankle monitor, and he went. He went to church, even having the virus. So that's that's basically an update up to this point. He was also accused of trying to run down a protester. He allegedly ran down a protester in a church bus, nearly killed the person, nearly, nearly ran the person over. And I think that's actually what he was in the court system over in the first place was that. Like I said, it's alleged, so I I don't know that for a fact. I wasn't there, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Would not surprise me. Anyway, let's give this article a read and see what it says. This is by Hemant Mehta on the Friendly Atheist website. Since being placed under house arrest a few weeks ago, Pastor Tony Spell of Louisiana's Life Tabernacle Church has continued holding in-person church gatherings, putting countless people in harm's way. He's also called upon supporters to send him portions of their stimulus checks. Oh, big surprise. You know, somebody made this point recently. The reason that a lot of churches absolutely refuse to do this over Zoom is because there's no collection plate at people's houses. You, The collection plate is at the church. Even though they can do it over PayPal or whatever, it doesn't matter in the end because you don't have your fellow churchgoers around you to pressure you, to peer pressure you into donating. All right, let's continue reading. In a video released yesterday, however, Spell claims he's had a change of heart, quote-unquote, and that he'll comply with the governor's orders to take safety precautions for all in-person gatherings. I'm just kidding, says Hemant Mehta. This moron said he won't obey the sensible instructions to hold church services outdoors and limit attendance to 25% of capacity until they sell popsicles in hell and set up an ice skating rink in the lake of fire and sell tickets for admission. What a sack of shit, man. Seriously. What a sack of shit. Like, this is for the public good. I, I, does he not realize he's getting people killed? Does he not realize that his fellow churchgoers, the members of his church, are dying as a result? And the the wider public is going to die as a result of what he's doing right now? This is absolutely disgusting. It's so sad. There's a three-minute video, so let's give it a watch and see what hap- see what he has to say here. May the 14th, the year of our Lord, 2020. Want to release some information of our hour and 44 minute hearing today before the federal court. The attorneys of our six defendants who we brought lawsuit up against, our attorneys, which Judge Roy Moore's lead counsel and several other attorneys, Jeff Wittenbrink, Colonel Eidsmo, uh, Attorney Matt, different individuals. Take a look at this weather. Thunderstorms today through Monday. Welcome to the sunny, liquid sunshine south. This is why we will never comply with the governor's orders to move church services outside. I have had a change of heart, though. At midnight tonight, the governor has asked that we comply with his 25% capacity order. I assure the news media today that we will comply with the governor's orders 
whenever they sell popsicles in hell and set up an ice skating rink in the lake of fire and sell tickets for admission. We will never comply with any anti-God, anti-church, anti-free American Christian order that says do not have church. Today, I still have this ankle bracelet on. I am arrested in my home. What has changed? What's changed is, starting this Sunday, we will operate at 125% capacity. Starting this Sunday, we will become more vile yet than thus. Starting this Sunday, people from Illinois, Indiana, California, Georgia, and New York, new state, will be in our services in person, where we will preach the unadulterated Word of God from an unfettered pulpit with boldness that will cause Satan and his imps to cower back into the lake of fire where they belong. So God bless us all. God bless America. We continue to do what we do with a change of heart that says, let's do more of it in Jesus' name. Okay. Um, I'm not really sure what to say about that. That's That was an extremely fascinating glimpse into this guy's mindset. He's like not just refusing to follow just the most basic vanilla guidelines. He is setting out to intentionally destroy those guidelines, do everything he can to make the situation worse. He said, no, I won't operate at 25% capacity. I won't even hold church services outside, even though it's, I see it's raining. I understand that that's an issue, the, the rain and everything. I get that. But I'm sure that there's a public park somewhere that you could use, that you could use for your services or set up canopies or something like that for your services. I'm, I'm sure of it. I'm sure you could do something like that. Instead, this guy is going to operate inside the church at 125% capacity, pack as many people as he can inside that church from as many states as possible, New York, Georgia, Alabama, so on and so forth, Louisiana, and all of the people that are packing into that church are going to get sick because, like I said, he had the virus. There are people there who have it. All the people packing into that church are going to get sick and bring the virus back to their states with them and make the cases worse. He is setting out to make things worse intentionally. He says, we will never comply with any anti-God, anti-church, anti-free American Christian order that says do not have church. Nobody said he couldn't have church. Nobody said that. You can have church online, or, or you can have church services outside, under canopies, at 25% capacity. What's the problem with that? If it's only 25% capacity, hold four services. This guy has deep issues. Th this type of person right here is going to be the downfall of America. It's going to be the downfall of the world. Imagine what would happen if this virus spread easier than it does. Imagine if this virus was airborne and if it killed 30% of the people that came in contact with it. This guy is already a super spreader. Churches are the ones who have given the most fight over the quarantine rules, it seems. Some of the, like, the biggest and most extreme churches. Like, look at the TV shows that have been airing. The Daily Show, Ellen, and, I don't know, Bill Maher, all of these other TV shows. John Oliver's TV show, Last Week Tonight, or whatever it's called. They all ended their studio audience thing and have just been doing stuff from their houses for, like, a while. And they're still disseminating information just fine. But churches can't figure this out. Churches and pastors like this guy right here are going to be the downfall of the world. 
Like they are are filled with stupidity and just don't give a shit. Like maybe he's trying to send as many people to heaven as he can. Maybe he thinks he's doing God's work by doing this or something. I don't know, but it's disturbing. He's lying because he's a Christian pastor who thinks his title grants him authority. No one said he couldn't have church. He can live stream his services, as many pastors have done. He can follow the orders and have smaller outdoor services. He's angry because he can't have everything he wants, and he believes laws shouldn't apply to Christians like himself. Spell went on to say he would have overflow attendance at future services, including people coming from out of state, which, which is to say he's going to create an environment where the virus can spread more rapidly and kill off more people. It's the Christian way. Those bodies are on his hands. That blood is on his hands. Surprisingly, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons stopped a lot of in-person stuff. Jehovah's Witnesses basically completely stopped in-person stuff. They don't hold in-person meetings right now during this pandemic. They have figured out Zoom and Skype and all that other stuff. Even like... The people who are not tech savvy in any way, shape, or form, they got letters and emails and stuff from the governing body directly explaining how to use Zoom and things like that. Why can't he be more like Jehovah's Witnesses in this one very specific way? It's heartbreaking. It completely blows my mind that this guy is is the way he is. It's disturbing. When we come back, we're going to talk about the Satanic Temple's infernal ritual outside the Washington State Capitol building and the reaction to it by Washington State Representative Matt Shea. So give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. So the next article I wanted to talk about is entitled Washington lawmaker Matt Shea owes $4,700 in cleanup costs after anti-Satanist protests. This is going to be interesting. So this is uh, by Hemant Mehta on the Friendly Atheist website. Let's give the article a read and see what it says. Back in March, because they were not permitted to give an invocation inside the state capitol to open a session, members of the Washington State chapter of the Satanic Temple held an infernal ritual outside the building. So it was interesting the Seattle Times said that uh, calling Matt Shea a domestic terrorist actually has made him more popular. I love that. I love that. They're finally figuring it out. And the fact is... They're trying to label us all. There were Christian nationalists staging a counter-protest as well. They were led by domestic terrorist and lawmaker state rep Matt Shea below, best known for his biblical basis for war manifesto and for proposing the creation of a 51st state just for Christians. Holy shit. While his rhetoric was overwhelmed by the Satanists' protest, Shea proceeded to pour olive oil on the steps of the Capitol, perhaps to anoint the place with Jesus or some religious nonsense like that. Whatever the reason, it did a shit ton of damage, and now the state has sent Shea a repair and cleanup bill for $4,761.34. Wow, that's that's crazy. I had no idea that it would do that much damage. He probably didn't realize that either. Fascinating. Extremely fascinating. I'm glad they're making him pay for it, though. Something I want to point out here, um, he says he believes that we should create a 51st state just for Christians. Um, If he believes that, then he does not believe that religion should be optional. He believes that Christianity should be enforced at gunpoint. I mean, think about this. A state is, as we're finding out in recent times, essentially its own government. Like, there's a federal government that's over top of state governments, but the, the states ultimately have a president and a House of Representatives and a Senate and everything, just like the federal government has. Only state presidents are called governors. They are their own distinct, separate governments. States are. So what he wants to do, basically, by saying he... he wants to create a 51st state just for Christians, 
what he wants is a government that will enforce Christianity at gunpoint. That's what he's saying. That's what he wants by proposing that in the first place. Shea, a Republican from the Spokane Valley, is being billed $4,761.34 for damage to the steps and base of Legislative Building North. Department of Enterprises, DES, spokeswoman Linda Kent said. Shea can be seen on separate surveillance video carrying a bottle of olive oil through Capitol hallways, on Capitol grounds, and on stone steps that ended up stained. In some of the videos, he is trailed by a group of men wearing black leather vests emblazoned with crucifixes. Several of the men carry shofars or ram's horns. How bizarre. How bizarre, man. Special care must be taken when cleaning and repairing historic masonry, such as the masonry of the legislative building, Kent said. There is considerable science involved in the preservation and cleaning of historic masonry. This idiot. Oh my god. This guy is so stupid. Oof. A costly bill and invoking science. It's a double whammy, but it's also deserved. Vandalism in the name of Jesus doesn't make it okay. Well said, Hemant Mehta. I 100% agree. Shay didn't respond to reporters for comment, but the Satanic Temple sure as hell did. Spokesperson Lucian Greaves told me this about the incident. This brings to question Mr. Shea's state of mind, his ability to distinguish reality from fantasy, and his competence in acting appropriately in ways that do not threaten the safety of himself or others. Yeah, I just want to point out, as far as I know, this may be incorrect, but I, I've kind of gotten involved in the Satanist movement a little bit, just talk to people about it who are Satanists and I know a lot about Lucian Greaves, and I know people who know Lucian Greaves, things like that. As far as I know, Satanists don't actually believe in fantasy or magic or Satan. Most of them are atheists. Anyway, let's continue reading. But while one may reasonably question whether or not Mr. Shea should at least temporarily be denied access to sharp objects in his own bank account pending further evaluation... Remember, this is Lucian Greaves speaking. There is no question that anybody possessed of Mr. Shea's flagrant antipathy toward the most fundamental principles of the United States Constitution should not be holding the office of one charged with upholding those principles. We can argue over whether or not we should keep sharp objects away from the guy, but he certainly should not be a member of Congress. If Mr. Shea is so offended by our First Amendment guarantees that he finds it impossible to accept public religious expression that does not align with his own, then I hope the people of Washington will demand his immediate resignation. This is America, Mr. Shea. Love it or leave it. <laughs> That's great. I don't think Lucian Greaves actually believes the whole love it or leave it thing. That's an extremely conservative thing to say. It was kind of mocking Mr. Shea by saying that. It's pretty good point. This is Hemant Mehta speaking again. He's right about the demand. There's no reason anyone like Shea should be in politics. He's a disgrace to a party that already recruits its lawmakers from the bottom of the barrel. If he cared about Washington more than himself, he would have resigned a long time ago. It's not too late. I wouldn't hold my breath. Not only is this guy convinced that he's doing the right thing and will stay in Congress as long as humanly possible, but he's willing to work with just about anybody who will support a Republican Christian nationalist. And there are a lot of organizations out there who want to support Christian nationalist Republican lawmakers. So um, I don't see him exiting Congress anytime soon. Hemant Mehta actually posted an update to this story. Here's what it says. Here's some unexpected good news. Matt Shea, the Washington state lawmaker who could do no right, won't be running for re-election this year. The filing deadline for his seat came and went, and he never submitted the paperwork, apparently on purpose. When we come back, we're going to be talking about large swaths of religious extremists refusing to take a vaccine, even going so far as to protest mandatory vaccine orders, which haven't even been issued, over the possible affiliation with stem cells. So give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com.
So the next article I wanted to take a look at is entitled Hardcore Christians Reject COVID Vaccine That Isn't Here Yet Because Stem Cells. This is by Terry Firma on the Friendly Atheist website. Let's give it a read. I can't wait to see who will write the first sweeping satirical novel about the corona crisis. Every day I see tons of material that would be absolute gold to someone like Tom Wolfe, gone too soon, or Chuck Palahniuk. I know I mispronounced that. I apologize. Today's novel-worthy WTF moment is brought to you courtesy of Christian factions who are already up in arms about a future coronavirus vaccine. Here's a quote. As universities and pharmaceutical companies race to put out the first COVID-19 vaccine, some sectors of the religious right are gearing up to fight it based on tenuous ties to what they call the abortion industry. Oh, my God. And a biblical teaching about the mark of the beast. People are nutcases sometimes. Seriously. This is nuts. LifeSite News, a Catholic anti-abortion website, has gathered more than 350,000 signatures, 400,000 as I write this, on a petition protesting mandatory coronavirus vaccination orders, none of which have actually been issued. We see the usual Alex Jones-type dross about how COVID fears may lead to the implementation of some hidden agenda of governmental as well as non-governmental bodies. But the real sticking point is the stem cells of two, literally just two, fetuses that were legally aborted more than half a century ago. One of the vaccines under development is said to contain infinitesimal amounts of DNA grown from those cells, and that's an immediate hard no from the so-called pro-life crowd. The LifeSite petition says that it is neither hot nor cold about any particular coronavirus vaccines produced without such moral problems. This is one area where such hardcore papists are actually more Catholic than the Pope. So this is an interesting point. A long time ago when vaccines were young, when the science of vaccines was young, we used stem cells to produce some of those vaccines. Now, we don't need the stem cells anymore for certain specific vaccines, for example. But the fact that the research came from stem cells at all is enough for people to call it, for Christian extremists to be like, okay, that's it. No, I'm not taking it. It's a huge problem. It's like, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? We could go pretty far down the rabbit hole. Let's continue reading this. The Pontifical Academy for Life National Catholic Bioethics Center and former Pope Benedict XVI have all determined that using vaccines cultured in stem cells is acceptable in the interest of public health, not least because they're so far removed from any actual abortion. Exactly. 100%. Just last year, the Pontifical Academy stated that parents could vaccinate their children with a clear conscience, that the use of most modern vaccines does not signify some sort of cooperation in voluntary abortion. This This is a very, very complex subject, but... We don't get stem cells from abortions anymore. This clip, I cannot imagine it's going to be on YouTube, uh, or it'll be heavily edited, or it'll just be demonetized, may even be pulled down. I don't know. Anyways, it'll be on the podcast anyways. We don't produce stem cells with aborted fetuses anymore. We used to do that. Now, we take an egg, and we take the sperm, and we put them together in a Petri dish, We let it grow for about three days, and boom, we've got 150 stem cells, just like that. There's no brain, there's no heart, there's no nothing. It's 150 cells. And to put this into context for you, the brain of a fly is 100,000 cells. So we're taking 150 cells for the stem cells. That's what we're doing when we get them now. That's how we're using them now. It's just completely absurd to me that people are so bent out of shape over this. There is a discussion to be had about this subject, but honestly, stem cell research is not where that discussion should be taking place, in my opinion. Let's continue reading. In a breathtaking display of holier-than-thou-ness, however, some religious leaders have gone so far as to declare that they will not accept a COVID-19 vaccine developed with these products, even though experts the world over agree a vaccine is the best chance to stop a pandemic that has already killed more than 300,000 people. So sad. Even with COVID-19, we're still debating the use of aborted fetal tissue for medical research. 
Bishop Jay Strickland of Tyler, Texas, tweeted in April. Let me go on record. If a vaccine for this virus is only attainable if we use body parts of aborted children, then I will refuse the vaccine. I will not kill children to live. I'm hoping Terry Firma has something more concrete than me to say on this because I am left speechless. But he's apparently fine with spreading the virus and killing others. Now it's a game of one-upmanship, obviously, expressed mostly through the number of capital letters each motor mouth is prepared to expend on proving his commitment to the cause. Deacon Keith Fournier, founder of the Common Good Foundation, tried to convince his Twitter followers this week that some COVID-19 vaccines are being made using body parts from unborn babies. I guarantee I and any other pro-life Catholic and any other true Christians will never use such a vaccine. Never, never, he wrote. Pretty sure that if useful cells could be harvested from long dead burned witches, these gentlemen would have no overriding moral issues. I agree. They would almost certainly be fine with it if these were witches that were burned at the stake. We strongly urge our federal government to ensure that fundamental moral principles are followed in the development of such vaccines. Most importantly, the principle that human life is sacred and should never be exploited, the letter says. We've seen in recent weeks just how sacred human life is to to people like these ultimately when it comes when it all boils down to it it's not about how sacred human life is it's not about caring about unborn children or any of that other stuff somebody i know has been saying recently that the pro-life crowd isn't really pro-life they are pro-birth and I think that's a pretty on point comparison. Um, the doctor in my Discord has been uh, has mentioned this to me. They're not pro life; they are pro birth because they don't give a shit about people after the baby is born. They only care about taking rights away from people. That's it. The moment that baby is out and and actually a human being, they will do anything they can to cripple them from birth. They will take the mother's ability to feed the child away by taking away food stamps, and they'll take away any possible welfare program. They'll limit how many people can be on Medicaid. Anything they can do to cripple people from the start and put it in the pockets of the rich, they'll do it. I mean, look at how much money they contributed to giant corporations during the bailout of the pandemic and look at how much money they invested in food stamps during that time look at the disparity between the two numbers trillions of dollars and during the pandemic actually they tried to take money away from food stamps they didn't fund it better they tried to kick people off of it so don't let them tell you that they're pro-life they are not the moment that baby's born they stop giving a shit We've seen in recent weeks just how sacred human life is to people like these. Resumes the petition text. Unwitting citizens must not be used as guinea pigs for New World Order ideologues. Oh my god, this is like conspiracy theories now. Or Big Pharma in pursuit of a vaccine and profits, which may not even protect against future mutated strains of the coronavirus. Or it may. And even a vaccine that's effective against the current deadly strain, which has already killed more than 308,000 people, is preferable to none at all, no? Maybe that's just me. It's not only Catholics who are already rejecting the vaccine out of hand. Surely you remember our old friend Kurt Landry, the pastor who intoned last month, Do not pray, do not hope, do not think. Oh, praise God, they are going to have a vaccine. That vaccine is from the pit of hell. Do not pray for those vaccines and do not take the vaccine. These vaccines are going to be coming. They are not going to be good. They're not good for you physically and spiritually. They're a setup for what shall come later. I don't get it. I don't understand what's coming later. Why aren't they good for you? I, I'm not getting it. I feel like these people don't know how vaccines work mostly. And that's probably why they're so against them. At this rate, after the toilet paper shortage, I think we may soon see shelves emptied of tinfoil. If there's an all-powerful God, he sent us not only the coronavirus, but also these bellowing buffoons who sneer at solutions. There are days I honestly don't know which scourge is worse. I think the extremist scourge is worse because that's a long-term problem. 
and it seems to be getting more extreme. This vaccine um, or the pandemic issue that we're dealing with right now, in two to 10 years, it'll be over. Either we'll all have herd immunity and we'll have a, a ton of deaths on our hands and, and that's going to be really bad, but it's going to be over after that period of time. These Christian ex extremists are setting out to make the situation worse, to make the pandemic worse, and to make people more and more extreme at all costs. I think the extremist scourge is worse than the pandemic because it's a long-term problem. Leah Bryant, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. I finally made my subreddit uh, r slash anti NIFB. Awesome. Please visit and let your viewers know about it. The goal is to make it a central hub to organize resistance to the NIFB. Also, please do a bite model analysis for Grace and Fritz, my local NIFB, local NIFB pastor, basically. I will check out that subreddit. That sounds pretty cool, for sure. I will look into making a bite model analysis of Grace and Fritz, because I, I know exactly who you're talking about. I've seen him speak before and everything, and he is definitely deserving of uh, more attention than he has. Spell sounds like a supervillain monologuing. Yeah, I agree. 100% totally sounded like a supervillain monologuing. It was really bizarre to listen to him. Reggiano Gray. If anyone dies as a result of his services, that person's family should sue him. I agree with you on that one too. I don't know that it would go anywhere. He probably wouldn't even give a shit about the lawsuit even if he lost him. I mean, look at the guy. He's got an ankle bracelet on right now. He's under house arrest and he doesn't give a shit. He's just do he's flouting the law anyways. Like he he's willing to sit in prison for the rest of his life to make our lives worse. It's insane. Uh, let's see, Leah Bryant. Worst case of Christian entitlement I have ever heard. 125% really fuck him. Just let Darwinism kill them all. Yeah, I know. I agree with you. But on the Darwinism bit, unfortunately, it's not just them that deal with the problem. Like, if they wanted to go out and do stupid shit that got them killed, fine. You know, I don't want anyone to die. I don't want anybody to get hurt. But if you are insistent that you want to do this thing and it's going to get you killed, fine. I can't stop you. There's nothing I can do. If you insist on getting yourself killed, I can't stop you. But it's not just them that's suffering from this. He's bringing people in from New York, Georgia, Mississippi, all those other states. And those people are going to get sick. They're going to get sick and bring it back to their states. He is intentionally acting as a super spreader. He wants to kill more people is what I'm reading from this. That's, that's what I'm hearing from his speeches. It's insane. Life in the doghouse. Let's be honest. Christian extremists are excited about this virus. For them, it's a sign of the end times and persecution all rolled into one. Yeah, I agree. Jehovah's Witnesses are pretty excited about it too. Although, like I said, they have been following the rules. In fact, they shut down in-person services before they were even ordered to. They, they were right on top of this. But you, you're right. Christian extremists have been talking a lot about persecution and the end times like it's been non-stop i also i appreciate that you said christian extremists i need to get into the habit of saying that not just christians christians are not the issue it's christian extremists that are the issue so thanks for um wording it that way the gaytheist i wonder how the anti-mask idiots feel about the no shirt no shoes no service rule <laughs> that's a good point what are you a cuck are you wearing a shirt right now only cucks wear shirts. <laughs> Only cucks wear eye protection when staring at the sun. Real men stare at the sun with their naked eye. People are so stupid, man. This is my mantra. People are so fucking stupid. Lucifer Lafleur, $6.66. I love it. That is an awesome donation. Thank you so much. I have satanic tattoos on my forearm right next to my big apostate tattoo and watchtower logo. I fucking love that. You need to send me an email. 
uh, with a picture of that or something. Or get on Twitter and tweet it at me, at Telltale Atheist. Send me a picture of that. That is the shit. I love it. I may even get a matching one. The JWs finally stopped calling on me. Hail Satan. That's that's awesome. That's the shit. G2, do you think morality is subjective? I think so. Uh, that's a complicated conversation. Yeah, it, there, look, usually in the is morality objective versus subjective debate typically it's a christian saying that morality is objective and it comes straight out of the bible uh we get our morality from the bible that's what they're saying in reality we don't get our morality from the bible that is completely outrageous I mean, just look at the Ten Commandments. Half of them are about obeying and worshiping and loving God and and groveling at his feet and not saying his name at certain times of the day and worshiping, the you're following the Sabbath, things like that. And some of the Ten Commandments are just things that cultures have known for like millennia, since long before the Ten Commandments were written. Don't murder, don't lie, don't steal. I mean, we, we've known those things were wrong since day one. We did not need the Ten Commandments to tell us that. All of the moral precepts in the Bible we value or that we believe to be right, we've known those since long before the Bible was written. I mean, we have older cultures that have records of those moral precepts. And all the ones that we don't have records for from before the Bible are garbage precepts. We shouldn't be following that shit anyways. Like, don't take God's name in vain? What? How does that have any kind of moral value? We should follow the Sabbath? The only moral precepts that come from the Bible, and only the Bible, only make sense from within the biblical framework and not outside of it. If you're not a Christian, they make zero sense. Is morality objective or is it subjective? Morality is subjective, but we all agree on certain things about morality. Like, we all agree murder is wrong. We all agree that lying is wrong. But there are exceptions to every moral rule. And we all agree on those exceptions, too. Like, for example, lying is wrong. But if what you're lying about is going to save someone's life, then it's right. We all know that. It's been built up and kind of programmed into us through the millennia, through empathy and a system of rewards and punishments throughout time, throughout the history of the human existence. It's been programmed into us, basically. So you could say that it's subjective yes it is subjective but there are objective things that we can agree on it's just when you go when you drill down far enough there are gray areas but there are black and white areas to morality that we can all simply agree on period murder is wrong unless you're saving the life of another person things like that or lying is wrong unless you are saving the life of somebody by doing so. That type of thing. Yeah, morality is subjective. I've read Sam Harris's book, The Moral Landscape. It's a, an extremely interesting book to read. Like Sam Harris or hate him, uh, he still has some interesting viewpoints on things. And he wasn't as controversial of a character when I read all of his work. And I did get some benefit from the work that I read at the time. So The Moral Landscape was an interesting book. You should give it a read, whether Sam Harris is a good person or not. Anyway, I'll tell you what, that's where I'm going to end it. I appreciate you guys coming on and giving this a listen, and I will talk to you next week. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and stickers and stuff on there. Second, you can support me by checking out my Etsy store. I sell 3D printed stands for every system from the original Nintendo to the Xbox One. And finally, if you want to support me in other ways, you can check me out on my other channels. I have the podcast channel, which is where I talk about whatever's on my mind. Politics, social issues, whatever. You can also find it everywhere podcasts can be found. Or you can check out the videos on my main channel where I focus on destructive cults. As it is with most channels these days, I rely on the support of viewers like you to keep my channel alive, so sharing my work is extremely helpful. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.